Well, hi there and welcome. It's great to have you here for this webcast. My name is Jonathan Faust and over the next hour we're going to have a short meditation and then a talk. And tonight's talk is on who are you in the absence of hatred, judgment and ill will. It's a really interesting kind of framework for exploring how to feel more free, basically. Thanks for making the time to be here. Before we begin, we have our traditional acknowledgements. First of all, to our mindful movement leader and to mindful dialogue leader, Rita Moran. At 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, you can join Rita for a mindful movement where she will most expertly prepare you for this meditation and talk. And afterward, you can join Ram Ray Manioki, who will expertly hold the space for mindful dialogue. It's an opportunity to connect with like-minded people share about your experience in your practice and in the talk. Those Zoom links for mindful movement and mindful dialogue are available on my website and also on my Facebook page. Please feel free to um, avail yourself. And thank you so much, you guys, for uh, offering this. Also, a big thank you to Glenn Harrison, our producer, for making this technically possible and to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for, for hosting this whole event. A um, little bit of shameless promo. I have a mailing list you can sign up for, a monthly, roughly a monthly, where I share my best photos and a kind of a compendium of talks. All my talks are available online, all meditations, YouTube, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, everywhere fine podcasts can be downloaded. Also, just to let you know, this is all offered freely. This is all offered in the tradition where no one should be denied access to these practices and teachings. Um, it's a neurotic way to make a living, but I love being able to share freely and to practice deeply. So um, it's so gratifying um, just to get feedback from people around the planet who find this helpful. And if you feel inspired to make that happen, um, thank you for your support. There may be a few spots in our week-long retreat down in North Carolina in two weeks. You can check my website for that. This is at the uh, Art of Living Center in uh, the mountains of North Carolina. Um, can't promise that, but you might check it out. It's going to be a pretty cool retreat, I must say. All righty. I think that's it for announcements. So let's take a little time to gather our attention and to settle into um, the here and now, establishing a sense of mindfulness. And we'll explore a little around this whole thing of who are you in the absence of judgment and ill will? This is such an interesting question. So you might take a moment. If you like, you can close your eyes and just ask your body how it might want to move or stretch. Kind of take some time to kind of get the wiggles out. Um, do you want to reach your arms overhead? And, stretch out from side to side might you want to just find some way to acknowledge your body and help to set the stage for your practice as you're ready if it's comfortable for you you can close your eyes and it's always nice just to acknowledge that transition from Eyes open to the external world, eyes closed and a heightened sense of the inner world. And you might like to do a few minutes of willful breath. One of the most classic and helpful techniques is to slow down your breath and to match the length of the in-breath with the length of the out-breath. You might inhale to the count of four or maybe five and glide right into the exhalation, exhaling to the count of four or five. And for the next minute or so, just explore what it's like to bring all of your attention to matching the length of the inhalation with the length of the exhalation. And notice what happens in particular as you sense on the out breath a quality of relaxation, a quality of softening, maybe even a quality of letting go. And 
over the next three rounds of breath, how much more intimately can you feel the breath moving on the inside? Would it be helpful to stay with the breath, this controlled breath? Are you finding it helpful? Or might you like to let it go? On the next exhalation, if you like, releasing all, all control of the breath and let your breath be completely unrestricted and free flowing and sense if you can, track the feeling of the breath on the inside. How much more could you relax? You might take a few moments to explore uh, a sense of softening from the inside out, sensing from the inside the forehead, relaxing your forehead and feeling your forehead smooth. Sensing from the inside the muscles of your face. Could you just track the sensations as you let your face completely relax and let all expression melt away? From the inside out, could you relax your jaw? Relaxing your tongue. And can you sense from the inside out the, the length and the volume of your arms? the volume of your palms and fingers and thumbs. Can you feel or imagine the, the space between your breastbone and your spine? the space between your navel and your spine. And can you feel the, the floor of the pelvis and the hip joints? And from the inside out, the, the volume and the length of your legs. The soles of your feet and your heels. And sensing through the whole body now, sensing on the inside through the whole body, is there anything right now that could relax or soften? And you might direct your attention to your breathing, 
Where do you feel the breath right now the most predominant? And for these next few minutes, you might let the breath be your primary doorway to the here and now. It's fine to use sounds or maybe the feeling in the palms of the hands. Any one of these doorways of breath, sound, feeling, let this be your way of coming back and rearriving. As many times as your mind may wander, that many times you can rearrive. You might notice that moment when the mind is far away and there is that realization that you've been lost in a thought bubble. Is it possible in that moment to bring in a sense of interest or kindness or compassion and to very gently walk awareness back, back to this anchor of breath or sound or feeling, to re-relax and to re-arrive? And you might just sense what it's like for you to investigate this sense of being the observer, or the witness. Who are you as the one who is aware? And here you might explore a sense of the foreground of your anchor of breath or sound or feeling and widen your awareness, noticing the entire field of, of change. What is changing right now? And can you let it be? And now, what would happen if you let go of all technique? If you simply relaxed, intimately felt what's here, and to notice what's changing? Is it possible to absolutely relax and feel and allow? And gently deepening the breath. Let your body begin to move and stretch in any way that feels good. Take this next little bit of time for your transition. There's no hurry, there's, there's no rush. Relaxing, feeling, letting your body move.
When you're ready, you can open your eyes. One of the things about a webcast live stream is you go with the flow. So I just uh, use a very sophisticated audio enhancement program by putting a pillow over the vent, which I forgot to do during the meditation. <laughs> so welcome back. One of my favorite stories is of a preacher who is standing in front of the congregation. <clears throat> he looks out over the congregation and he says, is there anyone here who does not hold hate in their heart? Long, awkward silence. And this little old lady slowly raises her hand. The preacher is kind of taken aback. And so he invites her up. And he says, uh, so Edith, you have no hate in your heart, but did you once have hate in your heart? And she said, oh yes, filled with so much hate, but, but not anymore. He asks her, well, Edith, what's your secret? She broke out in a big smile and she said, they're all dead. We all hold hatred in our hearts, or we have held hatred in our hearts, and maybe the nemeses in your life are dead. Maybe they're still going. But I would think it's safe to say that you know what it's like to be caught in judgment and ill will. When you're trapped in judgment, ill will, and hatred, there's no way out. You're just absolutely caught. and. What I've noticed is that for myself, when I find myself ruminating on how I've been wronged and betrayed, whenever I'm feeding that, that sense of revenge, it reminds me of that line that says that when you cultivate hatred for another, it's as if you're drinking poison hoping the other person dies. The another analogy is that when you act out of hatred, it's like picking up a hot coal to throw at the other person, not realizing that, that you're the one who's being burned. So hatred, judgment, Ill, Ill will are part of the life experience. They're also referred to as one of the three poisons of the mind. And again, when you are filled with ill will, judgment, hatred, and lots of other uh, synonyms, which I'll share in a little bit, it's impossible to feel fully present, to feel fully awake. But it opens up this question, which I'm exploring in my own practice and which I'm excited to share with you is when hatred isn't there, what's left? And so the question is, who are you in the absence of hatred? Who are you in the absence of judgment? Who are you in the absence of ill will? So I'd like to explore with you four elements. The first is examining a little bit around this question. It's a very powerful inquiry. Who are you in the absence of hatred? The second is to explore how in our desire to be free from hatred, we all have this tendency to rush into premature transcendence or, or spiritual bypassing. And when you can actually turn to investigate and explore the experience of these emotions, in the absence of when you kind of clear it out, there can be this arising of clear seeing, this arising of compassion the arising of love, the arising of kindness, and finally, ultimately, the arising of, of deep inner freedom or liberation. I saw an article a few days ago about an early heat wave in West Africa. It came on early and it's really, really hot. Uh, I was in the Peace Corps in West Africa in, in Niger. So I just checked, what's the temperature in Niamey, which is the capital city of Niger, where I was in the Peace Corps teaching at the uh, University of Niamey. It was 110 degrees, pretty hot. 
And it reminded me of uh, an experience I had kind of along this theme. Um, I lived right by the Circle Nationale, which is where um, everyone had to check in after crossing the Sahara Desert. And um, I had a big house. It was more like a, like a warehouse, and um, I didn't own anything. So I was always meeting people um, who were coming to kind of check in, get their papers stamped. And um, I would invite them just to stay at my place. And uh, basically, I would just say, look, I meditate twice a day. Um, I play music twice a day. I, um, I, I take some time to write every day. Other than that, if I have that, this is wide open space. So it was really, really fun just meeting international travelers and uh, word gets out on the travel route. So people would just sort of like stop in and say, hey, could we, um, could we crash here? So at one time, there were like seven or eight uh, Germans who were traveling together. They were mostly my age. And um, they had their vehicles, you know, they crossed the Sahara Desert and then they take some time to recuperate b before pushing on uh, throughout West Africa or maybe making their way to Central Africa. But they stayed with me for a couple days. And one thing I kind of loved about this was how the evenings would just kind of come together. We just figure out something for dinner. So we, um, we had a kind of a big dinner and there was kind of music and laughter at one point um i was off doing something and so they're all talking in german and i just thought what's this strange feeling i have as i was listening to them and i realized it sounded like like a movie where the bad guys of course were german And I got to kind of sense this sort of bias that I had toward German and German is bad. And then I thought, my father fought in World War II, was wounded twice, missing in action um, uh, for twice, got commendations for days of sustained combat without reinforcement. And I thought to myself, how many years ago were our fathers literally trying to kill each other? I thought about my dad. What would he have experienced listening to a bunch of young Germans talking and laughing? Would he be thinking, this is the enemy? So here I was, like, listening as the host. I was feeling happy that there was a sense of harmony in my house. And here I was listening really in the absence of hatred. <laughs> to the sense of kind of a, 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 a kind of a joy, a sympathetic joy at what a good time everyone was happening, was having, having. <laughs> so an interesting question, you know, for me is how easily just one generation back or how many years back could that have been me seeing these people as the enemy and instead seeing these people as allies? So I'd like to eat, lead just a short, short little inquiry. If you like, you can close your eyes. And you might bring into mind someone in your life who's an irritation, not, not your arch nemesis, but maybe on a scale of one to 10, someone you find just kind of a pain. And you might just take a moment and let yourself settle on this person. And if no one's there, you can make someone up just to kind of get an idea of this. And you think about this, the issue in this relationship and your reactivity. It might be judgment. It might be self-protection. It might be some kind of ill will toward this person. And when you have a sense of it, just exploring the, this question. Who would you be if this relationship was no longer an issue in your life? And more specifically, what would it feel like inside if this relationship was no longer an issue? So you might deepen your breath and feel like you can open your eyes and maybe there is a tiny glimpse there 
who are you if this is no longer an issue? One of my favorite inquiries, kind of inspired by Locke Kelly, is what if this is not a problem to be solved? It's just a very interesting exploration. But usually what happens is we're so locked into our point of view. Something happens and we don't like it, and we just lock in. This is bad. But if you think about it, if you get a little splinter in your finger and you ignore it, what happens? Well, it's going to be painful. And if you continue to ignore it, it might get infected. And if you continue to ignore it, that, that, that infection will fester. And at some point, it's going to feel painful enough where it's going to have to be drained and cleaned out and, and healed. And I think it's the same way when we experience ill will, when we experience hatred. So I looked at synonyms. And here are some of the synonyms. <laughs> and you might, just an invitation, you don't have to, but if you like, you can close your eyes and just take a moment as you hear the word, just to kind of sense if you've ever experienced this before. Anger. Feeling judgment toward yourself or others. Just a sense of general ill will. Irritation. Resentment. Hostility. Bitterness. Animosity. Malice. Vengefulness disgust. There's such intensity in each of these words. As I kind of reflect on these words, absolutely, I've experienced all of these multiple times. The question is, as I experience and as I experience them, how much are they living inside? Because undigested emotion is toxic. It will like that splinter, it festers. We tend to see it most in our intimate relationships, of course. If you're familiar with the Gottman Institute, they, they have a research-based approach to relationships, which is very interesting. And they talk about the four horsemen, the challenge in, 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 in relationship. The four horsemen are these. First is criticism. When you're locked into critical behavior, with your partner or your intimate relationships. The second is defensiveness. That's not taking in what the other person says and tied in with that with, with stonewalling. Just the willingness not to, not to take in what your partner is saying, putting up that, that wall. And it's been suggested that there's one emotion, if, it, if this shows up in your relationship, it suggests that it's very, very difficult to overcome this one. And that word is contempt. If there is contempt in your relationship, there is a lot of reparation required. So criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, contempt, these are the poisons in relationship. And it's so important to normalize the experience of judgment and ill will and hatred. It's all part of the human experience. And of course, we judge ourselves for judging. We hate ourselves for being caught in a cycle of hatred. We're disgusted with ourselves for our capacity for, for malice. And so given that this is part of the human experience, what do you do when you realize your system is flooded with hatred and judgment and ill will? You could just try to say, I'm done with judgment. I'm done with hatred. From now on, I'm going to feel compassion. I don't think it works that way. <laughs> 
I think these, this little phrase from Rilke is key. Rilke said, do not seek love. Seek only to address the barriers to love. That is loaded. Do not seek love. Seek only to address the barriers to love. So to my mind, what that means is, if you want to be truly happy, you've got to make room for what is not happy. If you want to open to love, you have to be willing to address the barriers to love. So the question becomes, is this something you actively do? Do you scan for the barriers to love or do you just pay attention to when it shows up? And this is, becomes a very interesting question that comes up with the practice of meditation. And quite often people will ask, well, should I be looking for something to work on? Or should I just try to be present and relax? What I've noticed in my practice is if you really slow down and you really start paying attention, you will be treated to um, an amazing three-dimensional or four-dimensional display of your history of undigested judgment, hatred, and ill will. You don't have to look for it. It will find you. I was thinking about this and I remember I was on a retreat meditating merrily along kind of a little bit of pride with how how much equanimity i had in my experience and suddenly i was like 11 or 12 years old back on the farm where i grew up we raised sheep on our farm and in the winter when the stream was frozen over and because we uh, we had lambs we had to we would keep the ewes with the lambs inside um, and then when it was really cold, we kept the whole flock inside. And that meant that I had to carry water um, for the sheep. It wasn't just uh, turning on a hose and filling these big tubs. I had to deliver it by hand. I had to hand pump the water and then carry it across the driveway and um, pour the water in and you know clean out the buckets and put the water. It was a lot of work particularly for like an 11 or 12 year old kid. There was one time when it was so icy and so cold, um, it, was, uh, it was hard to even carry the buckets because it was so icy, that I just spaced out. I, I skipped bringing water to the sheep one day. I went in the next day and they were, they were parched. I would pour buckets of water into the tubs and they were all fighting to get at the water and they drank it all down and I had to I had to refill it and the sense of dread that I felt the the, the suffering that I had created for for these animals was just overwhelming such self-judgment how how could I have how could I have let that happen it was anger toward myself and as I sat with it there was I felt anger toward my parents. It was too much responsibility for a kid. You know, they, they, they never followed up. They just assumed that I would do it and I spaced out. And as I sat there in meditation with nowhere to go, all I could do was go to the deepest place of, of that pain, that, that searing feeling of regret. And the interesting thing is as much as I sat with it, it didn't, it didn't let go instantly. I'm not sure it even let go fully. But I was able to see it and make room for it. There's a story of the Dalai Lama when he was asked, to, is there anything you regret in his life? And he said, oh, many things. The reporter asked, well, can you give me an example? And my understanding of the story is the Dalai Lama said, well, when I was very young, an old monk approached me, uh, just been installed as the Dalai Lama, and an old monk came to me asking to do these practices that were much more vigorous and for a much younger man. They were like, you had you know, yoga postures and stuff like that. And I said, no, you're, those are for a younger person. You should stay with what you're doing. He said, I found out years later, this monk had committed suicide. 
and a belief that he would pick up a younger man's body and do these practices. The reporter asked him, well, what was that like? He said, a horrible regret, I just a horrible self-recrimination. It was just, just horrible. And the reporter said, well, how did you make it go away? And the Dalai Lama reportedly looked at him incredulously and said, I didn't. It's, it's there. It's a question of how I hold it. When we slow down, we become more and more aware of everything that's undigested inside. And the question becomes, do we try to compartmentalize it? Or we do, make, do we make room for it? And while I can still touch into that genuine sense of regret over my lack of paying attention and its effect on these innocent animals, it's also reinforced my desire to do no harm in a very, very powerful way. It's also given me a little more self-compassion around who I was back then. So the question becomes, what does it mean to make peace with all of those undigested experiences? And the question I find inter interesting is, have you, have you ever forgiven someone? Like really forgiven someone in your life? I do my best to be honest. And I, I think I, I honestly have, at least in some cases. I can't resist from sharing this. I've shared this little joke before, but that line that says, walk a mile in someone's shoes before you say anything negative. The corollary to that is that way you'll be a mile away and you'll have their shoes. But the key here, and one of the many, many strategies for making peace with our undigested experiences is the capacity to roll reverse. The capacity to get to that searing pain. If there's anything undigested in terms of forgiving another, the key will be to really deeply imagine what they're feeling. To deeply imagine their unmet, unmet needs, what they're hoping for, what they were wanting. The willingness to go to to the core of the pain, to acknowledge that that searing ouch that you felt. To understand that forgiveness is not a fast process, but over time, with attention and care, forgiveness can occur. It can happen. So it becomes a very interesting question to really ask yourself honestly, what's between you and feeling love? What's between you and feeling truly happy? What's between you and feeling truly free? And when something arises in your consciousness, when you recognize something, it's always helpful to remember the formula for investigation. There are many formulas for investigation. But the, 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 the formula for RAIN, R, recognize or realize what's presenting. And when you've named it, to notice, does anything shift when you've named it? The A, to ask yourself if you can, if you can allow it, if you can accept it right now. And to listen deeply somatically, because sometimes you can't. It's too much. It's not the right time. The conditions aren't right. In which case, you let it know you see it another time when the conditions are different. Make room for it. But if you can, it then opens up the next inquiry, which is around, can you be intimate with it? Are you willing to investigate the experience inside? That's a whole art of recognizing that your issues are indeed in your tissues. To explore somatically, to explore your thoughts. 
which leads to the N in the equation. Is it possible to nourish what you find with some kind of loving presence, some empathy or compassion, and then to track how does it move, how does it shift, how does it change? And then to sense what it's like to feel anything that may have shifted, to sense who you are as the one who is aware. If we have time, we'll come back and explore this in a, in a particular inquiry. But it's a fascinating journey to, to recognize and name hatred, ill will, bitterness, negativity, whatever it may be. And to ask yourself, can I have tea with this? What can I learn from this? What does this need from me? And ultimately, who am I without this? I'm not a big sports person. I, in the past, have followed football. And they say you, you just watch the sports you watch with your dad. and um, So I watched some football games over the years, less and less, and now almost nothing. But one of my favorite moments after any sporting event is when it's over. Watching the players greet each other, acknowledge each other, thank each other. You know, many of them, like in football, for example, they play together in college. Now they're on opposing teams. Just to kind of see that camaraderie, it's really kind of cool to see how competition morphs back into friendship. And if you follow basketball at all, or if you have in, in past decades, one of the greatest rivalries in basketball was between Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. Um, Larry Bird played for the Celtics, Magic Johnson for the Lakers. Magic Johnson is this amazing guy, kind of dazzling smile, you know, outgoing, eloquent, urban, he grew up in Flint, Michigan. And incredible dynamic ball handling skills. This incredible African-American urban culture, as opposed to Larry Bird, who was a white guy, they would call him the Hick from French Lick, Indiana. Uh, he was kind of slow-footed, a little slow, flat-footed, but he was a shooting wizard, and he was an amazing guy. They were two of the best players, and they were in a classic rivalry, you know, the uh, Celtics and the Lakers, and, and they kind of hated each other because they were in competition all the time. And, the national champions would always go back and forth between the two teams. And so they were both incredibly competitive. And um, in 1985, um, they, they both signed up to do a Converse sneaker commercial. And they shot the commercial outside Larry Bird's mother's home in Indiana. And they had never really spoken together because they were always, you know, jostling and pushing each other around on the court. And um, Larry Bird said that he just assumed they'd go their separate ways over lunch, but, but Larry's mother invited Magic up for lunch at the house. It was there that she confessed to him that, that he was <laughs> her favorite player. <clears throat> and suddenly they realized how much they had in common. And these two classic rivalries became committed and lifelong friends. And when Johnson was diagnosed with HIV, there was a lot of stigma around that back then. That Larry Bird was one of the first people he called. And I love that story of how hatred, ill will can be converted into a powerful sense of compassion. So in the absence of hatred, there's more space for compassion. There's more space for, for loving kindness. When you're locked into hatred and ill will and all those synonyms, it closes the heart. It usually leads to some kind of har harmful actions. And in its absence, there can be this natural expression of kindness and compassion. 
And it's very interesting if you have a chance just to look on YouTube as these two guys talk about their relationship, of how much more harmony and peace they felt inside themselves. How much more, how much more calm they had. And this becomes such a fascinating thing in practice, at least I think it does. Because we have this tendency to sort of focus on the negative. We have this negativity bias. And so it becomes, can you imagine the absence of hatred? Can you imagine an opening of compassion and kindness in your life? I don't, th don't have the time, unfortunately, to go into a lot of the practices, but I'd like to name some of the practices. The practice of compassion and the practice of empathy. And that is simply to feel or imagine what another person is feeling. To feel the hearts quivering in response to suffering. The forgiveness practice, forgiving yourself, allowing yourself to be a learner, forgiving others for the harm they've done you, asking forgiveness for the harm you've done others, with practice, with patience, you can find that sense of hatred beginning to dissolve. The practice of mindfulness, to, 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 to see clearly the truth of your experience that when any of these undigested emotions arise, to see it clearly, to make room for it, if you can. The practice of, of relationship, of being in relationship with others, the capacity to, to draw on support, to offer support to others. The practice of, of service as a way of transformation to make yourself available to others who are suffering is all ways that we can begin to shift this hardened heart and explore kind of the opposite of it. Another element that can occur in the absence of hatred and ill will, in addition to kind of this flowering of compassion, is the arising of what we could call clear seeing. When I was in college, I worked on a farm all through college, and one of my buddies hired on as a truck driver, you know, delivering uh, grain to um, from the field, delivering it to the uh, to the place where they would dry it and then sell it for us. And he got into a bitter argument with the uh, with the farmer who I worked for. He said, "I know you got paid three hundred dollars for that load of wheat." I only got $30, you're ripping me off. And the farmer, who was a good friend of mine, I really admired, you know, he heard it and he said, look, here's my monthly payment for the truck. Here's my insurance payment for the truck. Here's what it cost me last year to re repair the truck. Here's the tax I pay for the $300 that I got for that load you ended up making more on that load than I did. And it was so interesting to watch the, f the face of my friend as he listened. He went from anger and outrage to a real sense of softening. When your mind is filled with hatred and ill will, it is utterly clouded and distorted. And inevitably, it will lead to misunderstanding and conflict. When you can shift to having a deeper understanding of yourself and the world around you, it can be a very powerful melting away of that cloudiness of mind. So kudos to my, to my friend, the owner of the farm, to explain so patiently, but also kudos to my other friend who was so angry, who was willing to listen. 
and to recognize that his anger and his, the fostering of his anger had created a very, very small, dark world that he was living in. As you explore more and more who you are in the absence of hatred, ill will, and judgment, inevitably you will start to relive your early experiences. And it becomes a very interesting question. How was hatred and ill will and judgment modeled for you when you were a little person? What was your strategy for being on the receiving end of judgment and ill will? How did you deal with it externally and what did you do with it internally? And inevitably, inevitably what occurs in our relationship to exploring this whole collection of anger, ill will, judgment, bitterness, blame, etc., 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 is it begins to reveal all of your conditioning. And it begins to open up this possibility, just a possibility, that you don't have to react in the same way. That you actually have options. That you can ask yourself what's happening externally and to realize that you can respond rather than react. I had an experience of it many, many years ago. Back in the ashram days, I was charged with raising money. And um, the leader of our community was really aggressive around um, that we should really be in people's face asking for money. We were kind of a retreat center. People would come to kind of get away. And we determined that after, after X number of visits, there would be enough of a connection that we could ask for a meeting and tell them our needs and all that sort of thing. And he was like, no, no, you're, you know, you're being too fearful. You know, if you believe in our mission, you should ask anyone, anytime for $1,000. And so trying to be the good citizen I was, um, I would ask for a meeting with someone. There was this one very, very nice woman who was there on a retreat. I asked for a meeting with her and I asked her for a thousand dollars to support our mission and the work that we were doing. Absolute outrage. Absolute outrage. I am one conflict avoidant person. My um, strategy around anger, ill will, judgment coming at me is to withdraw and run. But here I was sitting in this meeting and for some reason, I don't know how, I don't know why, I was able to lean in. I was able to kind of get, get curious because it was so clear that her, her outrage was bigger than, than me. I actually had this image of like, like a hairdryer, <laughs> just this energy coming at me. And I found myself really feeling empathic. You know, it, it, what would it be like for me if I went somewhere and I was spending money on a retreat and some young guy asked me for money? And it was so interesting, my capacity to kind of recognize her anger to allow it and make room for it and to kind of get curious around my experience, to get it curious about her experience and to sort of meet it with a sense of understanding. I don't know if it was actually nurturing, but it was, it was holding it with a sense of equanimity. To watch her, her anger and her ill will kind of crest as a wave and on the other side, stay present, to stay really, really present with her was a, it was an amazing experience. It was a kind of a beautiful experience for both of us because I got to stay on the wave with her and she got to ride this wave of feeling her righteous anger and it was absolutely righteous anger. But on the other side to have someone who, who stayed present for her was really powerful. And what happened so much 
is we feel hatred, we feel ill will, we feel contempt. It starts as a wave. It, it builds as a wave. First we feel the irritant. Then we find our, our kind of reactivity. The wave rises. Usually that's when we bail. We just we want off the wave. And so we distract ourselves. Either we, we judge ourselves, either we disassociate, I mean, we've all got all the strategies that can do that. And of course, what occurs is we get off the wave, we distract ourselves. But if you can stay on the wave, that wave, whatever the, the, whatever the emotional wave is, on the other side of that wave, the wave will crest and then the wave recedes. In this particular instance of feeling all that ill will and hatred, on the other end of the wave was a sense of this energy just passing through. And a sense for her, someone stayed present to me in this very, very challenging emotion. If we can do that for ourselves, when the wave comes to stay on the wave, to ride the wave, to feel what's on the other side, sometimes there's some insight. Sometimes it's just an energetic experience like a weather system has moved through. It's such a powerful way of staying deeply present to ourselves. So hatred, ill will, judgment, blame, all those synonyms, they're such a deep source of suffering. Not only for the one who holds on to it, but everyone around us. When you can make room for and transcend hatred, you can find freedom, freedom from stress, freedom from suffering, and you can begin to experience a deepening sense of peace. So when anger arises, when hatred arises, when ill, Ill will arises, it's so help, helpful to remember something the Buddha allegedly said, that hatred is never relieved by hatred, only love. Why don't we take a few minutes, we have just a few minutes left, for a little reflection. If you'd like, you might close your eyes. And over the next three exhalations, explore how much more you might soften or relax on the inside. Can you imagine in your life as you ride these waves of feeling, these waves of emotion, as the wave arises of judgment toward yourself or others, ill will, hatred, to ask yourself, can I name it? Can I make room for it right now and to deeply listen? And if so, can I turn toward it? Can I make room for it? This splinter, how does it want me to be with it right now? Can I bring some understanding, some compassion, some empathy to this? And as I do so, what changes, what moves? And as you sense the play of hatred, ill will, judgment in your life, just sensing in this question, who are you in the absence of hatred and ill will? Can you sense the possibility of hatred and ill will replaced by a sense of kindness and compassion, of understanding and clear seeing?
Thank you so much for your time and attention. I hope you found this helpful. It's a deep pleasure to share these practices and teachings with you. So many blessings in your practice. Next time we're going to explore, we're going to explore in the next couple talks these absence ofs. Uh, I find it to be a pretty juicy part of my practice right now. Thank you so much.